Having dealt with the rebels Sclerus and Phocas, Basil II was securely installed as emperor by 989. However, he still had scores to settle and foreign foes to conquer. During the remaining 36 years of his life and reign, Basil engaged in unceasing activity. As a result, Basil's career is even more complex than its sheer chronological length would seem to suggest. As a result, I have decided to divide my treatment of his life into portions defined by time period and geography. This episode will focus on Basil's activities in the East from 989 to 1002. Although Basil began his Bulgarian War in 991, and this was his consuming passion until 1018, Basil and his generals were also active and mostly successful in the East. Additionally, since Basil published his land laws on the heels of an Eastern expedition, I will cover Basil's land laws and their implications here. My current plan is to cover the war against Bulgaria in the next two videos, and then conclude with the video on Basil's last years. Michael Pacellus was a child when Basil died. However, he was one of the most important historians of Basil's reign due to his role at court as an imperial tutor in the decades following Basil's death. Pacellus has accordingly had a great deal of influence on how we view Basil. And unfortunately, as some modern Byzantine scholars such as Catherine Holmes and Anthony Caldellis have pointed out, we do need to be very cautious when handling Pacellus' account because he was a rhetorician, a moralist, and someone who was operating in a courtly environment who was not really free to engage in what we might think of today as history. Pacellus' work in many ways is an exhortation. He wants to convince his followers, or at least his audience, that they too can be like Basil. What he tries to do is normalize and sort of make mundane the achievements of Basil by trying to reduce Basil from an extraordinary man who achieved some godlike military successes to just a guy who was of absolutely normal ability but who worked extraordinarily hard and therefore achieved extraordinary results. In other words, he was trying to tell the emperors of his own time to get off their lazy asses and go out and command armies. And the idea is if they just work hard enough that they can replicate the success that Basil had because Basil was just detail-oriented, methodical, and didn't really have any particular talent. He just worked really hard. And there are reasons to question this portrait. For instance, Pacellus has Basil as this kind of slow, plodding general who moved slowly but inexorably towards his objectives, but didn't really have a ton of actual skill. But we know that Basil actually could and did move extremely quickly. And if you look at all of the great generals in history, most of them, or at least all of them I can think of, can move as quickly or more quickly than their contemporaries. Speed is very important in military affairs. He often trusted subordinates with major responsibilities, unlike what Pacellus has to say, which is that Basil always commanded in person. We know, for instance, that he left the East in the hands of Nicephorus Uranus, and that he also employed Uranus in Europe at various times as well when he needed backup fighting Samuel and the Bulgarians. He also had other subordinates, but he tended to go with the people he trusted the most and he liked to have his proven commanders on standby. Pacellus also claims that Basil preferred rough men of no learning over aristocrats who were refined. But we know that while Basil did promote some newcomers to the game, he also did work with a great number of aristocrats as well. He was just very selective about who he worked with. He had to personally trust someone and that was probably a result of his early experiences having to deal with Phocas and Sclerus. That being said, he really didn't govern that differently than other emperors, and while he did fight in person, this does not mean that in an empire as large as his, he could afford to command every battle. As we'll see, there are plenty of important battles that occurred during his reign where he wasn't within a thousand miles. So, with all of that in mind, 
let's proceed forward to 989 and talk about Basil's operations in the east. While Basil was busy fighting the usurpers Sclerus and Phocas, Devit of Tal, third of his name, was trying to set up a larger empire in the Caucasus for himself and his family. Without issue himself, Devit chose his cousin Bagrat as the king of the neighboring kingdom of Abkhazia, and then adopted him as the heir of Upper Tal, so that upon his own death the two realms would unify and there would be a Caucasian empire under Bagrat. However, this was not to be, as Basil did not want to have a strong Armenian kingdom to his northeast. In general, the Byzantines were interested in decently sized buffer states, but ones which were not large enough to constitute any kind of potential threat. Basil therefore started a war with Upper Tal in late 988 and into 989. Devit III was forced to surrender. However, Basil was mostly generous in the peace. Devit received the court title of Curo Pilates and he also retained Upper Tal for his lifetime. However, and this is a big however, Devit had to agree to bequeath his kingdom not to his nephew, but rather to the Byzantine Empire upon his death. This is a big deal. Tal is an area approximately the same size as Cilicia. This means that in a short campaign, Basil won a territory the same size as Cilicia, which took Nicephorus Phocas and his family quite a bit longer to conquer through a great deal more campaigns and bloodshed. This was an absolute coup, and it's especially impressive if we consider that Basil effectively just took the army that he had used to defeat his rivals, maybe integrated some of the newly surrendered men, and then just marched against Tal. This was not a planned expedition. There was not a lot of planning or effort that went into this compared with most campaigns. So this was almost free money. Despite having many opportunities in the East due to weak enemies, Basil was intent upon finishing Zemisky's project of subjugating and integrating Bulgaria into the empire. After he returned from the East in 989, Basil would spend the next two years in the capital preparing for his Bulgarian war. It is possible that had events not intervened, he might have only needed a single season to prepare himself for the Bulgarian war, but as things worked out, it ended up taking a little longer. The reason is that on the night of October 25th, 989, there was a huge earthquake which struck Constantinople and did a great deal of damage to many of the city's buildings. The most notable damage occurred at the Hagia Sophia itself, the city's most iconic building, where the dome and arches were damaged. This would take four to six years to repair, and it was obviously something which demanded some of Basil's attention. All of the sources for Basil's eastern campaigns explicitly state that Basil's priority was always Bulgaria. These sources here would all mention that Basil might come to the east, but they would say that he was always in a hurry to get back to Bulgaria, or that he was hesitant to leave Bulgaria for the east. So even while we're talking about what Basil does in the east, keep in mind that his mind is always in Bulgaria. To fully appreciate the importance of Basil's eastern operations, we need to consider their place in his overall strategy. His number one priority at all times was Bulgaria. However, this does not mean that he neglected the East by any stretch of the imagination. Basil himself always retained the Varangian Guard. This unit was about 6,000 strong and it was a core personally loyal to him. It is also possible that in order to have overwhelming force against Samuel and the Bulgarians, that Basil may have removed a few of the field units from the East in order to reinforce the Army of the West. Traditionally, Byzantine emperors tended to put most of their forces in the Eastern Army, as that was where there was the greatest avenue for expansion and opportunity. That being said, as Basil was on a defensive footing in the East, he may have removed a few units in order to um, not have them waste their time. He also did not appoint a domesticus of the East 
because he didn't want to empower an aristocrat at the time who he couldn't trust yet, so there was no grand commander in the east. However, this does not necessarily mean that his local commanders were hopelessly outnumbered. Most of the enemies in the east were either weak or somewhat inactive. The one exception, as we'll see, is the Fatimid Caliphate, which had been relatively inactive up until the 990s, and then randomly decided to become aggressive, as we'll see. Basil's policy was effectively to let his generals handle things in the east, and if something were to go awry, if they were to face a major setback, then he would go undo the damage and then hurry back to Europe. When he did go east, Basil went with style, and he went with overwhelming force. His goal was to try to win as quickly as humanly possible, but also win thoroughly, which is why he always came with an army that no one in the East could hope to match. Many scholars say that Basil had three Eastern campaigns. I think they're wrong. There are four campaigns because I count the campaign that Basil waged against Davit of Tal in 988 and 989. Two more of his Eastern campaigns will basically be the crux of this video and then the final eastern campaign in the early 1020s i will save for the final video of the series but despite having a very limited number of campaigns and not spending very much time in the east compared with the time that he spent in europe basil still did accomplish a great deal as we will see and not just when he got david to name him as his heir for upper Tal. In the absence of a Domesticus of the East, Basil had to personally approve of the movements of all of his armies, and nothing was really delegated on the strategic level. This means that when one of his vassals, say the Emir of Aleppo, needed reinforcements, he had the first right to Basil. His envoys would have to travel to Bulgaria, find him, then come back and deliver the news to one of his more local generals, in this case the Dukes of Antioch, Michael Bortzis. So this was a somewhat clunky arrangement, but it did prevent him from having to appoint a Domesticus of the East who might become a potential rival. At this point, the revolt of Phocas and Scleris was still a little fresh, and Basil was not quite ready to trust anyone with that level of responsibility. He also probably had some doubts about Bortzis, despite Bortzis' long service and experience, due to Bortzis being involved both in the overthrow of Nicephorus Phocas and also being involved in some double dealing during the crisis involving Bardas Phocas and Bardas Scleris. When the Emir of Aleppo found himself under siege by the Fatimid general Bakjur, he, of course, appealed to his suzerain Basil, and then Basil approved of reinforcements from Antioch. So Bortzis led down 6,000 imperial troops. This resulted in a battle in April of 991 near the city of Aleppo, where the Aleppo and Byzantine army faced off against Bakjur and the Fatimids. The allied force was successful. Bakjur was captured and executed. The old emir of Aleppo died early the next year, and he was then succeeded by his less able son, al Fadil. This also led to some of the Aleppan officials defecting to the Fatimids because they thought that this new leader would not really guide them anywhere and would be kind of a problem, a liability. Aleppo, however, would prove to be fine, largely due to Byzantine support, but also due to the wisdom of a new vizier who rose up to prop up this young, weak ruler. Nonetheless, it would be a weapon weakness, at least the perception of a weapon weakness, which would really draw the attention of the Fatimids, and they would continue to attack at Aleppo. After Bakjor's death, the Fatimid Caliph Al-Aziz appointed Manju Takin to take his place at Damascus, and despite the advice of one of his own viziers, he insisted that the Fatimid Caliphate's number one priority should be to capture the Emirate of Aleppo. Manju Takin took up his post in 992 and renewed the war. I presume that he had to bring a substantial number of reinforcements with him from Egypt in order to resume the war so quickly. 
Manju Takin was able to take the Aleppans by surprise and smash an Aleppan army at Apamea. He then laid siege to Aleppo itself, which led Basil to send orders to Bortsis to intervene once again. Manju Takin anticipated Bortsis' intervention. After all, it's pretty easy to predict, and given how the Byzantine system works with orders, this means that the Fatimids, after invading, have a certain amount of time where they can operate with virtual impunity before they have to worry about imperial forces arriving on the scene. Manju Takin therefore planned well for Bortsis' eventual moves, and he decided to march north to head off Bortsis before he could reach Aleppo. Before Bortsis could properly deploy his army and march down to help the Aleppans, Manju Takin had abandoned his siege of Aleppo and he had marched north to Antioch itself. Therefore, Bortsis found himself thrust on the defensive. Manju Takin had a much larger army and he was laying waste to the Antiochene countryside in the summer of 992. Bortsis was outnumbered about 6 to 1. The sources say that he had 5,000 men in his army as opposed to 30,000 Fatimid soldiers under the command of Manju Takin. We don't know the total size of Bortsis' army, presumably he had some second line troops holding down the city of Antioch, but in terms of men who were fit to take the field, he had maybe 5,000. Trailing Manju Takin for a while, Bortsis eventually decided that he needed to take a stand somewhere where he could really offset his numerical disadvantage. He therefore decided to hold a bridgehead on the Orontes River and let the Fatimids come at him. Despite choosing a strong position and a valid strategy, however, Bortsis was defeated and then forced to fall back to Antioch. Manju Takin was now able to leave Antioch at his leisure and attempt a new siege at Aleppo without fear of a Byzantine intervention. With the capital of Syria having its countryside devastated, Bortsis would need to reconstitute his army and also worry about keeping his people fed, so he would not be in a great position to try to intervene. However, Manju Takin's efforts at Aleppo were once again not successful, so he retired to winter quarters at Damascus. Basil was probably not terribly thrilled about the events of 992, but he does not seem to have been terribly worried either. At this time, he was involved in a four-year non-stop campaign against the Bulgarians, and while this was somewhat annoying in the East, this was hardly a catastrophe or a red alert. Manju Takin's assaults continued in 993 and 994, although we don't really know the exact sequence of events in 993, aside from the fact that the Fatimids continued to make progress. By the time 994 rolled around, the Fatimids had secured control of the city of Apamea, installing a garrison, and they were also launching naval raids along the coast of Syria on imperial territory. In the spring of 994, Manju Takin marched to Antioch first in order to lay waste, intimidate Bortsis, and only then did he turn south to Aleppo. Basil once again sent orders to Bortsis to save Aleppo, and also finally sent reinforcements under the general Leo Melusinus. We don't know exactly who was in charge once Melusinus arrives, but given Bortsis' seniority, he had been the Dukes of Antioch since about 969, it seems that Bortsis was probably in charge, and I'm going to work on that assumption. The way the sources phrase it, they could have been in co-command, however, or their commands could have been separate, it's not entirely clear. Bortsis decided to shadow Manju Takin once again, and he and Melisinus mostly just fought against the foragers. So the idea was not to engage directly, but rather to try to harass Manju Takin and deprive him of needed supplies so that he would be forced to break off the siege. They did not feel comfortable, obviously, trying to fight Manju Takin on equal terms. They simply did not have the manpower. Bortsis' strategy of trying to harry Manju Takin and make life miserable for him was a solid one. However, Manju Takin was equally aware of what Bortsis was trying to accomplish, and he knew that his best chance for conducting a successful siege was to get rid of the army which was trying to harass him. 
So accordingly, he lifted the siege at Aleppo and pursued Vortzes in order to force him into a battle. On September 15, 994, Manjutakin cornered Vortzes and his Byzantine Aleppo army at Apamea. Apamea is not far to the north of Aleppo, and if anything, I think that Apamea was really the center of the conflict between Byzantium and the Fatimid Caliphate throughout this entire period, throughout the 990s. I actually was tempted at one point to name this episode the Apamea episode just because of how many battles take place at Apamea, but I resisted the temptation because I also had to talk about some stuff that happened in Tal. Nonetheless, this battle fought on September 15, 994 proved to be a very hard-fought battle despite the fact that the Fatimids had a massive numerical advantage. The Byzantines especially were said to have fought most valiantly. Nonetheless, the Aleppans eventually broke, and when they broke, the Byzantine line also buckled, and this led to a pursuit, which favored the lighter-armed and faster Fatimid forces. During the pursuit, Vortzes lost some 5,000 men, which, if we looked at his earlier numbers before he got reinforced by Melissenus, would constitute basically his whole original field army. The sources don't quite specify how many of the men were Byzantine and how many were Aleppo, but in either case, this was very bad for their chances at holding Aleppo. So Bortzes and Melissenus were crippled, and now Manjutakin was able to besiege Aleppo in earnest. He, was so, he felt so secure after this battle that he was able to remain there over the winter of 994 to 995. It's safe to say that this was a true crisis, and as soon as he heard the news, Basil was convinced that this event required his intervention. Over the course of his 50-year imperial career, Basil II had many stunning successes and did a lot of things which are profoundly impressive. For me personally, however, his epic forced march from Bulgaria to Antioch is the most impressive thing that he accomplished. He did this march in early 995. This is right when he got news of the Battle of Apamea and the crisis facing the, the Emirate of Aleppo. Basil was deep in the Bulgarian heartland with his army, yet he knew that he needed to personally arrive in the east in order to deliver the Aleppans and contain the Fatimids. Knowing that speed was vital and that the clock was ticking for Aleppo, Basil quickly rounded up all of the horses and mules he could find, mounted every single man in his army, which numbered probably around 30,000 men, and then traveled overland from where he was on campaign in Europe all the way to Antioch. Incredibly, and in an unprecedented fashion, Basil was able to pull this off, including having to transport his men by ship across the Straits of Marmara, he accomplished all of this in under a month. When Basil appeared at Aleppo unannounced, Manjutakin immediately panicked and then bolted for the safety of Damascus, not coming out again until Basil had returned home. So Manjutakin, who himself was a relatively talented and experienced commander, recognized the insanity of what Basil had pulled off, and he was duly impressed by it. This is not the kind of commander who was one to shit his pants, but what Basil accomplished was exactly the kind of thing which was worth shitting one's pants over. With Manju Takin's men beating a retreat, Basil met with the Aleppo emir al fada Il, who prostrated himself before Basil. Basil then generously forgave Aleppo its tax burden for the last few years so that it could focus on recovery. For this generosity and also for taking extraordinary measures to reach his vassal, Basil attracted a great deal of praise from Eastern sources who were especially impressed that a Christian overlord would go to such measures to help a Muslim vassal. Basil then embarked on a mass scale show of force all around Syria, and he effectively erased all of Manjutakin's gains in a single season of campaigning. One thing he was not successful at, however, was taking the city of Tripolis. He had a month-long siege, and despite having a pro-Byzantine faction inside of the city, 
it did not fall to his forces. This would also be a pattern of Byzantine operations in Syria that one city they could never take was Tripolis. He did, however, establish a strong garrison to the north of Tripolis at Anteridos. Basil then marched back to Antioch and thence to the capital. But as I alluded to at the outset, his experience in the east was not quite over. When he stopped off at Antioch, Basil knew that he had to make some changes in order to solidify his eastern frontier and make sure that a repeat of the Battle of Apamea did not occur. He was angry with Bortses and held him responsible for the disaster and therefore had him removed from command and placed under house arrest. It's also possible that he had Bortses arrested and removed prior even to his arrival, but the absolute chronology here is not exactly clear. According to Anthony Caldellus, he thinks that Basil had Bortzes effectively sacked for incompetence and for losing an entire campaigning season in Bulgaria. And while I think that there's certainly something to that, I do think that there's a little more going on than just that. Bortzes' removal and punishment may have been a delayed punishment for his earlier behavior. And also, it may have served as a weather balloon for his actions against other aristocrats he distrusted, such as Constantine Malienus. Basil, who was not as old or established as Bortzes in some ways, maybe just wanted to see what would happen if he removed a senior commander. Just wanted to test the boundaries. And when everyone thought it was acceptable and that his actions made sense, perhaps this is what emboldened him to go forward with his land reforms which we'll get to in just a moment. As for the new dukes, this was Damianos Dalasinos, who was the first member of his family to rise to a high office. We know that Damianos was at least middle-aged by this time. He has two adult sons, so he has a combination of experience and ability. And just as Pacellus sort of hinted at, he was not one of the sort of inner nobility However, as we'll see, he was a worthy contender, so regardless of how literarily accomplished he was, he was still an excellent choice for the office of dukes at Antioch, and he would prove himself to be worthy of the honor on a few different occasions. While Basil was traveling home with his army, he happened to stop by in Cappadocia, where Constantine Malienos generously offered to feast the entire army at his personal expense. For Basil, this probably showed that there were some families which were simply too powerful. Constantine Malienos, by the way, was the father of someone who had done a great deal to help finance the usurpation of either Sclerus or Phocas, and so Basil would have been especially miffed by this display of great wealth by somebody in the family. Constantine Malienus, by the way, had been retired for a long time. This man was about 90 years old by this point. So he personally didn't pose a real threat, but this family's established wealth certainly did. Basil accordingly decided to act friendly towards the old man and had him escort him back to Constantinople. Then when he was in Constantinople, he had the old man sign an agreement that he would hand over his land when he died. So basically this was an upper towel situation, but on a much smaller scale. Then in January of 996, Basil issued his famous land laws, which lay out a number of provisions designed to protect peasants from being exploited by the Dunatoi, the Byzantine aristocracy, the powerful, and by the church. That creates a lot of controversies that we'll get into. One of the more interesting aspects of Basil's land laws is that he does name specific abusers in the edict, people who have gone beyond what the laws allow, people who are holding land illegally. And one of the people he names is his supposed friend, old man Constantine Malienos. So I think that there is a great deal of evidence just in the way that these edicts are written that there is a personal agenda at play. But let's talk about these land laws and how a few different scholars tend to look at them and look at their significance. One quick note before we get into how particular scholars look at the land laws, there is very little, if any, evidence about how Basil did or did not enforce these laws. So while we can talk about 
what the laws were, we have no idea to what extent, if any, they were actually ever enforced, or if Basel actually governed in a different way on a meaningful sense than his predecessors and successors. We know that his successors allowed things to get out of control. We don't know if that's because Basil didn't do enough or whether this is because there was a reversal of what Basil tried to do. Most, but not all, of Basil's land laws were passed in early 996. They dealt with issues of land ownership and the transfer of land from one person or institution to another. And while these are not necessarily the most exciting reading, these are things which are at the heart of Byzantine society. And this is very much Basil dealing with central core economic issues in his realm. Because of the way that his laws are written in a strongly moralist uh, tone where he says that he's defending the small man against the great landlord and that he's standing up for justice against greed, there have been people who have tried to paint Basil as some sort of a class hero for the small farmer against the greed of the military aristocracy, the Dunatoi. But that interpretation has largely fallen out of favor, although it still is around. Tim Gregory, in his textbook by Blackwell, does effectively carry this traditional narrative, although he goes into a great deal of detail and provides some reason to believe that this might actually be the case. He says effectively that defending the small peasant uh, farmers is an important way to keep the military running. The army's backbone had always been peasant farmers, and protecting their lands from predation was a essential thing that you had to do to keep the armies working the way they're supposed to. It was core to the thematic system. Catherine Holmes, who's written a book on Basil as a governor, effectively, how he ran his empire, argues that Basil's main priority was trying to secure his position against the Dunatoi in the wake of the revolts of Sclerus and Phocas, and that he was effectively trying to create weapons he could use in theory against the Dunatoi. So by wording his laws so strongly, he was daring the Dunatoi to cross him. He was also giving himself a legal avenue by which to pursue them if he needed to. This is also around the same time that he declared that all of the um, laws that were promulgated by Basil Lacopinus, his uncle, were no longer valid and that land deeds had to go back to at least the time of Romanus I to be valid. Interestingly enough, Romanus I passed similar laws to what Basil passed when it comes to land tenureship, and um, if anything, some scholars think that Romanus's laws were actually stricter, even if they are a little less dramatic in terms of taking a strong tone. Anthony Caldellus primarily follows Holmes's thinking and says that if we look at Basil's land laws, they're just a handful of laws over a long period of time and they probably weren't terribly systemic. There certainly is nothing like a class consciousness guiding this effort. He thinks that rather than trying to regulate the Dunatoy by regulating the size of their estates, that Basil's strategy was more or less to regulate them by either granting or depriving them of offices strategically by making sure that his key followers got the high offices and that the people he couldn't trust were deprived of those offices. He doesn't think that Basil was really stirring the nest by trying to take away lands, even though Pacellus explicitly says that Basil made it his mission in life to deprive people such as the Focates of their ancestral allotments. And in fact, despite that claim by Pacellus, um, there are a few sons of Bardas Focas who later take up office under Basil. So there is some contradiction there. And I think in this case, we have to follow the more material evidence as opposed to the claims of the rhetorician Michael Pacellus. When it comes to the truth about Basil's land laws, I myself do not claim to know, so I will leave that to you to decide. Getting back to the main narrative, let's look at the activities of the new Dukes of Antioch, Damianos Delicinos. <laughs> 
Basil probably left behind some of his forces since the new Dukes was able to take the field in late 995 and continue the offensive. So even after the majority of the Byzantine army was gone, he still had enough force in place to take the initiative. This makes me think that perhaps Basil was deliberately trying to limit the hand of Bortzes, but held a great deal more trust in Bortzes' successor, Dalasinos. But that might be a different story for a different time. I plan on doing videos on Bortzes and Dalasinos going forward as part of the Romans of Renown series. In late 995 and early 996, Dalasinos was able to continue to make solid gains. He captured the fort of al Lakma and managed to take many prisoners in the process. He also made two attempts to secure the city of Tripolis, possibly because he had heard word that there was an armada being formed in Egypt proper aimed at Byzantine Syria. He thought perhaps that by taking Tripolis, he would put the Byzantines in an impregnable situation where this attack by the Fatimids would be bound to fail. At any rate, though, Dalasinos was not able to capture Tripolis despite these two attempts. Caliph al-Aziz was deeply distressed when he learned that all of Manjutakin's gains in Syria came unraveled due to the rapid campaign of Basil II. Accordingly, he wanted to arrive himself in Syria and make great gains for his caliphate. So he started to build a grand armada in the Nile and preparations were underway in early 996. However, in May, the fleet caught fire in the harbor and people's suspicions fell upon Amalfitan traders out of Italy who were then scapegoated and massacred until Alaziz's viziers restored order. By the way, Amalfi at this time was something of a city-state akin to Genoa, Pisa, or Venice, but on a smaller scale. So they were unfairly scapegoated because the thought was that since they were part of southern Italy, they were sympathetic to the Byzantines. And it is possible that they were responsible for burning the fleet, but most likely it was some other fluke accident. And then once these ships are packed into the harbor, they're all wooden vessels close together. If one catches fire, then they're likely to all go up. There was a certain public spirited response to this disaster, at least after the massacre ended, however, as Alaziz had lumber taken away from public buildings to get underway with construction of a second fleet. However, he fell ill in August and then died in October. So effectively, there was no real Fatimid armada at least not as originally intended. Nonetheless, the fleet did eventually set sail without the Caliph and it did arrive to aid Manjutakin. Although as we'll see, this was an ill-fated expedition from the start. Manjutakin took his army from Damascus to Aleppo in 996 and then moved to the coast in order to link up with his fleet. His plan was to besiege and capture the coastal city of Enteridos in order to further enhance the defenses of Tripolis, which was the real prize for the Fatimids. Predictably, Dalasinos marched down from Antioch to contest the result at Enteridos, and at the same time, the Fatimid fleet appeared from the Nile. So, for the first time in a long time, Manjutakin found himself substantially reinforced and having naval supremacy which is important if you're besieging a coastal city. Unfortunately for the Fatimids, and very fortunately for Dalasinos, a great storm struck the fleet right as it arrived, and most of it got smashed. Manjutakin looked around at the situation, saw it was hopeless, and he fell back. The Byzantines were then able to simply march to the coast and pick up the ships that had been blown ashore. So they got a bunch of ships for nothing and an entire campaign season was lost due to a storm. So this ended up being effectively a great victory where Dallasinos had to do practically nothing, which is obviously what you want if you can get it. So I have to say that at this point, Dallasinos is looking pretty lucky, but as with many supposedly lucky people, his luck would turn out to be a little bit fickle. From 997 to 998, 
the Byzantine forces in Syria were relatively quiet. They were not really faced with any threat from the Fatimids, and that is because Manjutakin, the very active governor of Damascus, was much more interested in bringing about a regime change back in Cairo than he was with pressing forward against the Byzantines. He revolted in 997 and asked Basil for support. However, Basil refused to help, probably because he figured that Manjutakin was more of a threat than a young caliph backed by Berbers, who most likely were not terribly accepted by many of the leading powers of the caliphate. By 998, Manjutakin's expedition had failed, and he was then imprisoned for the remaining several years of his life. However, when the city of Tyre revolted against the Fatimids, Basil did send support because he wanted to interrupt Fatimid naval operations. So, effectively for two years, aside from a little bit of diplomatic haggling, nothing really took place on the frontier, and Dalasinos and his men were able to get a little bit of rest. By 998, the Fatimids had replaced the imprisoned Manjutakin with Jaish ibn Samsama, and despite the fact that the war against the Byzantines had been something of a colossal failure throughout the decade, the Fatimids were determined to continue pressing forward for whatever reason. Jaish was able to then retake Tyre from rebel forces, which was his first accomplishment. But it would appear that the Byzantines for the most part thought that the war was over, or at least that the Fatimids would go back into being passive for at least a while. When a fire broke out at Fatimid-held Apamea, however, the Aleppans saw an opportunity to seize an important nearby city and quickly laid siege to the city before Dalasinos arrived and told them to leave that this was going to be handled by imperial forces. Both of these allies were eager to get a prize effectively for free, and neither suspected that the Fatimids would be able to really respond with any kind of force or vigor. However, Jaish would prove to be very much up to this challenge. He responded to Apamea's plea for assistance and then moved north with a respectable army that I feel there's evidence the Byzantines didn't think that he could have mustered. So as I promised earlier, once again, all eyes turned to the city of Apamea, which was mostly significant because it was a strategic hub near Aleppo. On July 19, 998, Dalasinos was confronted by Jaish, and this led to a second battle at Apamea. It would appear that both commanders decided to station themselves in the center of their respective armies, um, this was fairly normal for Arab forces, so far as I'm aware, but it was a bit unusual for Byzantine forces. Usually, the commanders would station themselves on the wings in order to try to exploit some kind of breakthrough or flanking attack. Dalasinos effectively just went full bore right after his opponent, and the Fatimid center was breaking, so the Byzantines began a pursuit but as the pursuit was getting underway, Dalasinos himself was mortally wounded. The Fatimids saw Dalasinos go down, and then they rallied, counterattacked, and carried the day, winning a massive victory even more impressive than the first Battle of Apamea. They inflicted six to 10,000 casualties on the Byzantine force, and you might have guessed it, this was enough to precipitate another crisis worthy of the Emperor Basil II. Despite the Second Battle of Apamea being a major victory for the Fatimids, they didn't really follow it up much, and Basil, for his part, was not really all that eager to get back to Syria. He thought that it would be best to negotiate peace and just take whatever deal the two sides could hammer out. A status quo agreement would be just fine, the Byzantines still held on to everything that mattered to Basil, but for whatever reason, it appears that the envoys of each side were unable to reach an agreement. It's also possible that perhaps I'm misreading Basil's intentions and he's just delaying, that he did intend to go to Syria, but he wanted his envoys to keep the Fatimids at bay. At any rate, Jaish seems to have not really been that interested in following up his victory. He thought that it was more important to purge Damascus of 
various anti fatimid elements. So he basically spent the next year or so at home dealing with domestic enemies rather than trying to capture fortresses in Byzantine-held territory. This meant that when Basil arrived in Syria on September 20th, 999, that he didn't really have all that many cities he had to retake. So his job was relatively simple, or at least a lot simpler than it should have been if Jaish had really tried to follow up his victory and tried to make some solid gains. His first stop was at the city of Apamea, where he went to the battlefield and had the dead buried ceremoniously and then erected a church over them. We have no direct evidence that he attacked Apamea, so he probably did not, but it is possible that the city came to some agreement with him because he came with a massive army and Basil had a reputation for being rather ruthless. So I would not be surprised if Apamea re-entered the Byzantine orbit just out of fear of Basil and his army at this time. After doing right by his war dead, Basil then moved to take the city of Shizar by siege. He succeeded there. This city had been taken by Byzantine forces earlier, but had randomly fallen back to the Fatimids at some unknown date. At the city of Olms, Basil probably assaulted the city and carried it, rather than conducting a siege. And the reason I think that is because when the city fell, the locals of the city took refuge in a church, but the Varangian guard had their blood up and they decided to burn these people alive and then plunder the city thoroughly. Basil also burned down the city of Arca. Then he moved on to Tripolis, his objective from four years earlier. Despite having naval support on his side this time, however, Basil was unable to crack Jaish's defenses, and he even suffered some notable losses during an enemy sally a week into the siege. So Jaish was a determined and skilled defender if he was able to hold off Basil when Basil had a full force in the field. The two seem to have gained a little bit of respect for one another, and by this point, both empires recognize the futility of further fighting, as no one is really getting anywhere, and they're spending a lot of money and blood to get there. By 1000, both sides were completely ready for peace. By this point, the Fatimid ruler was Al-Hakim, who was a minor, and his vizier at this time was the eunuch Barjawarin. He was in favor of making peace in Syria and focusing on internal problems. As for Basil, we've known all along that he did not want war with the Fatimids, and he would have been willing to make peace at any time. His focus, as always, was on Bulgaria. So the two sides were now in agreement, and therefore they agreed to a 10-year truce. The truce was phrased as more of a ceasefire than a peace. Both powers saw themselves on some level as being the defenders of their respective faves, so they couldn't really pretend that they were friends. At the same time, they didn't really have that much interest in continuing to butt heads. So despite the fact that the truce was portrayed as a temporary measure, it ended up being long-lasting. Al-Hakim reversed many of Barjawarin's policies later, after he came of age and executed his former vizier, but he never violated the truce. He never decided to go back to his father's war against Byzantine Syria. Both the Byzantines and the Fatimids had no real desire to change the status quo in Syria, and so it stood for about 50 years. I think that Caldellus is right that Byzantine ambitions didn't really go too far south of Antioch and that most of the things they captured nearby were more or less to kind of try to shore up their hold in Antioch. They weren't really that interested in going much farther south. Basil was encamped in Cilicia in the winter of 1000, and he was anticipating marching back to Constantinople when the snows cleared. However, he received news that Devit III of Tau had died, and so he felt that he was given a perfect opportunity to go claim and tour his new possession. Accordingly, he went to Upper Tau in order to establish his presence there, and because he did not yet trust any of the locals, he wanted to travel somewhat light, so he had an advanced force under him, and then he had his trusted general Nicephorus Uranos backing him up with an army shadowing him from a moderate distance. After the tour of Tau, Basil then appointed 
Nicephorus Uranos as the new Dukes of Antioch, and probably also created a new office for a Dukes of Iberia based out of the city of Theodosiopolis at around this time. It may have occurred later, but most likely it was at this time. In order to secure the loyalty of all of the various grandees in Tal, Basil handed out court titles. This is something that he also did to surrendering Bulgarians, so this was a common tactic for emperors in general, and for Basil in particular. But there was one person who was very important whom Basil's titles did not appease, because he happened to hurt this man's feelings, but not giving him a sufficiently grandiose title. By early 1001, Basil was on his way back to Constantinople. However, a crisis was brewing in Tal, which would require him to issue some orders. This was not a crisis that was grave enough for Basil to even consider intervention unless somehow things went really sideways. This is one of the weirder and frankly dumber crises in Byzantine history that I'm aware of. Effectively, what happened is that when Basil was handing out titles, Gergen of Kartli was offended that Basil gave his son a greater title than himself and therefore decided to invade Tal to avenge his honor. Now, this might sound like an insult, since typically you would think that a father should be at least equal to his son, but Gergen of Kartli was simply a less big deal than his son, who was Bagrat, the king of Abkhazia. That's why Basil had given Gergen, or not Gergen, excuse me, but Gergen's son Bagrat a greater title. Bagrat had been the heir to Tal up until 989. He had to be appeased more than Gergen, who was more or less a no one. This is the first time Gergen appears in Byzantine records, by the way, at least I'm aware of. So Basil ordered his general from Antioch, Nicephorus Uranos, to intervene, and effectively this led to a prolonged standoff over the winter of 1001 to 1002 at Basayan. Fortunately, this did not require an outright war between Uranus and Gergen, and this whole thing was resolved by diplomacy. Presumably, Gergen got his title and went home. And then after that, there were no further troubles in Tal for a while. So again, it's a weird incident, but I found it fascinating. So I included it. Over the course of this video, I hope that I have proven that Skylitz's assertion that Basil really neglected the East and didn't accomplish much there is false. Despite the fact that Basil didn't spend much time in the East, nor did he appoint a Domesticus of the East, he was still able to accomplish a great deal there, and in fact brought about stability, peace, and even expansion. This is impressive given that this was far from his top priority in the eyes of literally everyone, including writers who were focused specifically on the East itself. As we'll see moving forward, Basil was destined to return to the East for a fourth and final tour in 1021, but that is a story for the fifth part of this series. As for the third and fourth parts of the series, we will be looking at Basil's Bulgarian War, the early part and then the later part, and in the fifth part when we do the conclusion, what we'll be looking at is effectively how Basil wrapped up things after his epic victory at Clydean and some of his later campaigns and even his aspirations. He was planning a massive campaign at the end of his life, which ultimately did not occur. But I don't want to spoil too much of what you couldn't possibly read for yourself in a history book, so I'll leave it there. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. You can follow me on Patreon and do all the things that people are supposed to do to support uh, creators that they like. Peace out.